Hello. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, the last live video, the last video of this year, 2023. Happy New Year. It's coming to a close. <laughs> Um, we have a lot to update you on. Uh, the primary purpose of this video, however, is going to be to update you on um, exactly why, like the thought process behind the, uh, the transom extension. Yeah, so it's been a very common thread in all the comments. It's either, you know, supportive people, which thank you, or other people who are uh, the opposite. <laughs> so there's a very common thread in the the opposite sentiment. So I thought this would be a great time to go through those comments and explain exactly what it is that we're doing. Because yes, it does look pretty ridiculous in the video so far, but it's not as ridiculous as people think. They just they don't know yet. So we're gonna be <laughs> we're going to be addressing specific comments that we've gotten on our videos so far, Hi, um, as well as just explaining some things to you that we haven't explained in the videos yet. Um, and I think the most important thing for you to know going into this is that in no way do we think that this boat needed any of this. <laughs> um, it. We, in, we need it for our own happiness. <laughs> yeah. It's, I think it needs it. <laughs> it's just, it, it's for fun. Like this yeah. is about the challenge. A lot of it, of yeah. building of, of building a boat to be what we want it to be. It's not about, it's not about like a very serious, you know, project that's going to like alter the way boats are built from now on. You know, this is, this is an experiment. <laughs> It is an experiment, yes. But, all right, so my thing is boats need, like for serious cruising, you need a stern anchor and you need a very strong, robust stern anchor setup. Boats don't have that. Like, look at any production boat and name one that's got a stern anchor setup that's ready to rock and roll. I mean, unless it's a boat set up for, you know, Arctic cruising, it's not going to have it. And it's a shame because they're, they're so important to have on the boat and we don't really have a good one on wisdom and that not having a good one has been really horrible and annoying like every time we want to use the stern anchor we need to launch the dinghy and then run it out with the dinghy i want this thing set up so we can drop and retrieve the anchor and use it like an anchor so that's one of the main reasons we're doing it is for the stern anchor yeah and then the others which are these get on the superfluous side are uh, I want some better protection for the monitor wind vane, and I want more real estate for solar panels, and uh, I want oh, an easy way to get on and off the boat. Like, you can obviously get on and off the side, but everyone tries to get on our boat from the back, because that's how you get on most boats, and there is no easy way onto the back of these kind of boats. So, I want to make an easy way. So, yeah, that one's superfluous, but the stern anchor one is a very serious one. And there's Jerry on your head. Yeah. yeah and if you hear, like, baby noises, the baby is right here out of frame. <laughs> um, I'm doing my best to... <laughs> I'm <he> doing <laughs> my best to keep him uh, occupied while we're, while we're doing this. Um, but I may have to duck out. We'll see how it goes. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to be uh, also reading, in addition to the comments we've received thus far... Um, for Herbie to respond to. I'm also going to be reading any questions that you have uh, regarding this build. So it can be, I mean, we hope that your questions will mostly be about the transom extension, uh, but you can also ask about the general build. I'm sorry. <laughs> I hope that you can't hear him that well because we're yeah. mic'd, but in yeah. case you can hear Harry, uh, yeah, he's very vocal right now. Nope. So, uh, yeah. So yeah, we hope that you'll, I'll be looking at my phone and we hope that you'll ask uh, your questions so that we can answer them directly on this video. Hi, Jerry. <laughs> um, so hi, Greg Cotton and Braith. Welcome. Thanks for joining oh, us. hi, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we met Greg down in Charleston. <laughs> yes. Yep. Uh, yeah, a little hey, bean. Charles. Okay, so with that, um, where is your phone with the, Ooh, here it is. There it is. So we're gonna get to our first comment that we want to address. It, it, it's a little on the longer side, but bear with it. 
Uh, Rich Morrow says, okay, I can't sit by silent any longer. This is the most poorly conceived, ill-fated boat project I have ever seen. With great expense and effort, you are taking a salvageable but pretty dated old boat, ruined, ruining her sailing qualities by adding lots of unsupported weight aft, will dramatically worsen pitching, already an Achilles heel of CCA era boats. Then, at the bow, end with all the massive structure needed to support the loads of a bowsprit. Make it weaker, new PE resin does not bond seamlessly with old, make a pretty boat into an ideal, idea, idiosyncratic mon monstrosity with zero resale value. No thought to what an altered center of effort with uh, with due to will do to balance uh, whether the stability characteristics form narrow beam low and disappearing freeboard and ballast will support a shred more sail area. If you wanted a 35 footer, you should have found one. Please don't risk your family on this fool's errand of a boat. You're no Carl Alberg, but mighty willing to mess with his work. At least consult a naval architect, and if you make it to the water, keep U.S. toe on speed dial. Yeah, that one. All right, so first there's, off. There's a the, lot to address. Yeah, so the first off of adding weight aft and how that's ridiculous, look at every single cruising boat. They put the cruising arch on, the radar arch, put a bunch of solar panels, those are heavy, and then they hang a dinghy off the back. Now, a really, really light dinghy weighs, you know, with an outboard on it, you're talking like 200 pounds. Our, our dinghy is super light. The dinghy itself is 50 pounds, the motor's 30, and then the battery is 40. So right there, like, we're over 100 pounds on ours, but it's the, it looks like a pool toy. It, it's a joke. Now, everyone's got, you know, the high field ribs and all that business. I looked up the weights. The lightest high field is about 120 pounds for the, their ultra light one. And then you put an outboard on it, like a 20 horsepower, because that seems to be the size most people have that we see. And that's another 100 pounds. So you're looking at 200 pounds. Now you get the actual dinghies that people use, and you're looking at about 500 pounds. So right off the bat, people hang 500 pounds off the back of their added weight radar arch, and that's okay. No <laughs> one complains. The bows come out of the water, the boats are horribly untrimmed, and they go cruising, and they're, they're quite happy. So that, <laughs> all right. And then as far as not considering the center of effort, I do rigging. That, that was literally my first plan with this whole thing. The boat has really bad weather helm. So in order to combat that, I'm adding sail area forward of the mast to give it more lee helm to balance the helm. And the sail plan that we're making, it's gonna have a, a Yankee set up like a flying jib. And that one we can literally bring fore or aft to control the center of effort and like balance it perfectly. And one last thing, uh, I, I get the feeling that this guy thinks that when you go sailing, you put up every sail you have on the boat, but you don't. You put up the sails for the wind and the course that you're going. If you're going downwind, you put up a spinnaker. If you're going upwind, you do not put up a spinnaker. That, that like we don't have to fly every sail that goes on a stay. We fly the sails that we need and we have lots of sails for when we need. Okay. As far as the... Uh, Naval architect. Yeah, that one I have been contacting a few. Some have responded. Uh, <laughs> one's been really helpful. I'm having a call with another one in January, which is right around the corner. So, yeah, this I, is not, I am addressing yeah, that. Yeah, this is not um, something that we're just jumping into blindly. Herbie's been talking with experts in all the fields that he is addressing here on this boat. He's been talking yeah. to uh, so, naval architects, but he's also been talking to people who work with fiberglass. Yeah, mechanical and engineers. Boat builders. Yeah. You know, this isn't. We realize that we're not experts. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, yeah, I am not an expert at everything outside of the rigging. So therefore I contact people who are, because that's, that's the smart thing to do. Like when we were making the mold in the first place, Warren knows how to make fiberglass stuff. Like that's what he's done for his entire career. So the way he said to do it is the way that I did it. And why? Because he knows better. 
It's, it's what you do. Uh, Derek asked, um, hey guys, just wondering if this is something that has ever been done before. Very frequently. A lot of boats get stern extensions put on and no one notices because you ferret in so then it looks right and it, it yeah, it's a pretty common it thing. It is a thing that people do. However, the way we're doing it is not something that's ever been done before yeah. um, because it's designed <laughs> specifically with our needs in mind. Uh, and so the monitor wind vane is central to this design, which means that we're actually building it around the monitor wind vane. Yeah. Um, so the main reason for the, for the building around, I, I have faith in my work, but I don't think I'm infallible. So therefore I'm mounting the monitor to the original transom so that if this thing gets ripped off, the monitor is still there. We still have the back of our boat. Now, I don't think it's going to get ripped off because I'm going through very lengthy steps to make sure that doesn't happen. But the monitor does put a lot of force on things and that force is best set further forward. Plus, I want to protect this thing because when we were in Portugal, I was docking the boat and we were all set and then I was adjusting the lines and I pulled the boat a little too far back and it literally just touched the pier and it was $800 in damage to the monitor. <laughs> so after that, I want a bumper. If we're gonna bump into something, I want it to be fiberglass and paint, not the monitor. So, so that's the real reason why we're encasing the monitor. Now, oh, another one that's really common. People say, why not do it like Duracell Project did where they put battens out and then you know built it straight from that like no mold no mass just build it out and and that is actually how they're normally done but for the well that we're putting in it would be a ton of work backwards to do that and then carve it all out so that's why we're making a mold and then doing it straight that way and then again along those lines we have a keel on our boat, Duracell Project. I don't know if they buried their keel or if they unbolted it, but their boat is very low to the ground. Mine's like really high up, so it's a lot easier to do all of this work at you know, knee level and bend over and break my back like I did yesterday, as opposed to be on a ladder eight feet up. So that's, that's why we're doing it in a mold. We make the piece and then we attach it afterwards. Um. Ed, Dr. Edgar Jordan says, no one talks about writing moment on these sailing channels. Yeah, so writing moment is, uh, well, there's two. You have the, the lateral one, which is the, the major one that people think of, and that one's affected by beam. Length doesn't really affect that at all. Uh, it's beam, draft, and displacement. Those are the, the factors to calculate your writing moment. Now, you do have the fore aft writing moment. Uh, that one gets, a bit more complicated because you start getting into moments of inertia and uh, then so what you need to do is figure out what is the center of gravity of the boat like what's the point of rotation or the axis of rotation for aft and then figure out how far from that point are you to figure out you know every pound is multiplied by that distance and it, it gets to be really tricky and picky and you can actually move the center of gravity by adding something aft like a dinghy or a stern extension, it'll move the center of gravity aft and then that point moves. So that's why people don't normally talk about that one because literally you filled your water tanks, guess what, it just moved. You emptied your water tanks, it moved again. So that one's a little harder to, to nail down. Okay, um, on our channel, on one of the videos, MB Chudno said, uh, seems to be pretty expensive, both in money and time work to make something more, something of questionable benefit. Yeah, well, it is a lot of time. It is a lot of work. The material costs are also there, which is why I'm using polyester resin because it's a heck of a lot cheaper than epoxy. So the gallon of polyester resin I'm using is $67. The cheapest I can get a gallon of epoxy is $100. So. I'm using polyester. And then in a previous comment, they talked about uh, don't use polyester because it doesn't bond well. You shouldn't rely on bond strength to attach things to your boat because if, they, if you don't have a perfect bond, they pop off. So my, my other job is I'm a dentist. And when you do the, the white fillings, those are bonded restorations and they're bonded to your tooth. And the way they fail most frequently is a bond failure. So I, I don't really have a lot of faith in just bonding. So I'm tying it in with a whole bunch of other ways. Um, Edgar 
uh, responded uh, by saying, yes, but you also need to consider the center of buoyancy. Yes, the center of buoyancy, yeah. So if we were below the waterline making this extension, we would be affecting the center of buoyancy. Since we are not, like this is a above water extension, it's not gonna affect it too much. Now when we heal, it then goes into the water and then the center of buoyancy does move aft because we made it longer backwards. So that is a thing. Now I am using our Morgan as pretty much like a model for this. It has a 10 foot stern overhang. So <laughs> I thought as long as I stay under that, it should be good. <laughs> oh, and, and also the, the main point of all of this, hey little Harry. <laughs> <laughs> the, the main point of all of this is to give us a really strong way to attach the stern anchor. So the, a bunch of issues of, oh, you're adding length, it's going to cost more every time you go into a marina. When you put the stern anchor there anyway, you just added length, your cost just went up anyway. So it's like, this is a stronger way to make it, and also make it a little prettier, because the stern anchor setups, they look like they were stuck on boats. So I'm trying to integrate it. <laughs> Um, thank you, Edgar. Um, let's see. On to the next, uh... Oh, this one's juicy. This one's juicy. Are you ready for some juicy? Boy! Oh, this is from PM Inferno... and Fernando. Boy, aren't you going through lengths to completely disfigure this classic hull? What about getting your hands in a cap horn wind vane, which is the most which is the most aesthetically pleasing wind vane out there. I appreciate the effort, standards, and practices you are applying, but this is just wrong. Sorry for the noise, guys. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> Wait, oh, let me just throw that one down. Okay, so the Cape Horn wind vane, or Cap Horn, uh, I've always pronounced it Cape Horn, but it is written Cap Horn. <laughs> okay, they are beautiful to look at but I do not like their structure. Uh, I know that the guy who made it and invented it had an Auberg 30 and made it for that boat, so I should technically use it because it's like literally the custom made wind vane for this boat. But I don't like a few major things. One, all the, all the rope routing is internal. So if there's chafe, you won't know it until it breaks. Where with the monitor, everything's external and you see it all the time. So you're constantly inspecting it, and then if you need to fix anything, it's all external. You don't have to like empty lazarettes for it. Second, the Cape Horn, the quadrant is at the back end of the aft lazarette. If you put anything in that lazarette that might jam it, it doesn't work anymore. So you kind of lose a lot of storage space in the boat by putting this thing on there. And then uh, the third thing I don't like about it is there is a hole. Like, yeah, it's, it's small, water can't get through, but there's a big, Freaking hole in the back of your boat. <laughs> I don't want to do that. <laughs> I'd rather do small bolt holes that are bedded and sealed than drill a giant hole <laughs> in the back to mount this thing. So that, that's why I'm not doing the Cape Horn wind vane. Uh, Peter says, why is it so difficult to attach a stern anchor to a normal transom? Okay, they're not set up for it. So the whole problem is that uh, you don't want to hit your boat with the anchor. <laughs> is what it really comes down to. So especially people who have a rake stern where you know the transom ends and then you have like a sugar scoop and all that coming down. Imagine if you drop the anchor off the stern rail. It's gonna smack into your top sides and chew it up. So you now need to get a structure that holds it out beyond and behind your boat. And then it needs to be able to take the lateral loads. Like it's a lot of force on it. And the, the one we made on Wisdom I thought would be good, and then the first time we were loading it, it was flexing, like, really badly. And I've seen a lot of stern anchors where they, uh, the, the stern anchor mount is actually bent. It's like, yep, they used it. So, so that's why it's hard to, uh, man, sorry guys, he is. <laughs> He's having a moment. Yep. So that's why stern anchors are hard to, uh, hard to mount, which is why I'm, there you go. Yep. Your mic. Your mic. Okay. So that's why the stern anchors are hard to mount. And then, well, I'm trying to build it in so it's integral to the boat. Because the ones that I've seen that are really, like, they're good, 
the anchor actually mounts into the hull. Uh, so it's like super well protected, which is part of why I'm using a Danforth anchor because they mount in really easily. The one that you will see on boats that come with a stern anchor have what's called a kedge anchor. It's a, a type of anchor, not one used for kedging. And they mount beautifully into the hull. And you'll see like the hull has recesses where the flukes go in, like, yeah. So those are the ones that come with it. Everyone else is just screwed and we don't get to have a good one. Okay, on to the next comment. What is the point of this modification of your boat? This mock-up doesn't look like it fits in my opinion. So yeah, the, the mock-up in the last video did not fit, which is why I was you know, frustrated and then had to go on and do a whole bunch more work. Uh, the, as said, this point is to mount the stern anchor, mount the solar panels, give us boarding access and protect the wind vane. That's the, the point of that. And that was D60433. I feel like that's a zip code. <laughs> All right. Uh, SV Veritas said, sniffing too much polyester resin. <laughs> that stuff stinks. <laughs> it's so it's stinky. It's so bad. Oh, like, Every time he comes into the house yeah. after he's done working, I, ha I make him take a shower immediately. Yeah, and you have to wash your hair because otherwise, like, you get a shower, you're all nice and clean, you come out and your hair reeks. It's, it's awful. So, yeah, that one, it, it's bad. So I got a, uh, the 3M big mask thing. Uh, it's amazing. You put it on, you smell nothing. It smell the world just, it smells amazing. And then when you take it off because you thought you were far enough away from the workshop, <laughs> it's like, oh, everything stinks everywhere. That's bad. Okay. All right. Here's a good one. First or second wave hit you, it's going to fall right off. Well, all right. I, I get the feeling that people think that we're literally just going to glue it to the back of the boat. And... No. That's not, yeah, <laughs> that's not what we're going to do there. So the, the, I'm making this shell. In the shell, we're going to then have stringers because the Auberg actually doesn't have any stringers, which are standard on boats now because if you have a stringer, you can then have a thinner haul, which is why in that video I did about boat thickness, it's expecting you to have stringers when you're figuring out your minimum thickness. Now, the Auberg's minimum thickness is like seven millimeters, and it ranges from 12 to 31. So it's like super thick, which is why it doesn't need the stringers. But in adding this extra bit back there, I'm gonna add stringers to the boat. And when we add them, I'm gonna use those to tie in this, this piece. And then uh, in a later comment, an issue was brought up, which then led to further calculations and it will be very robustly attached to the boat, so. That. All right. Here's a good one. Uh -huh. Let why? me read this one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. oh, well, no. Sorry, I ruined, you ruined it. It. <laughs> it just says why. Yeah. <laughs> Which I, I can understand the confusion as to why we'd be doing this because, you know, we're building this boat to go cruising. Why am I spending, you know, a year on the butt of the boat? <laughs> and it's because when you're actually cruising, you spend more time anchored than you do actually sailing. So having, you know, more solar means we can charge our motor faster. Better running of the stern anchor, like all these things. It's, it'll, yeah, we've wanted this on Wisdom so much and Windpuff is going to be getting it. <laughs> okay, here's a long one. Please read that one. <laughs> okay, uh, Dr. Kiwano says, Seeing the quick glimpse of your planned length and boat in the side-by-side -side picture at 28 seconds, I'm a bit confused by the what, by the what's going on with the backstay and the extension. I mean, there's, there looks to be a line drawn from the existing backstay to the extension, so I'm guessing that with all the other rigging up forward, there's going to be more sail area before the mast. And some sort of crazy business is being done with the backstay to accommodate a larger main to balance it out which is definitely necessary on an Allberg 30 as the design already features a mast that ha was moved aft to re rebalance the rig when the, sailors, the sailors who commissioned the design insisted on a, ma a masthead rig. Carl Allberg's original proposed design had a fractional rig 
And this is why the bee birth is so roomy. If what I think is going on is actually going on, then I have a few words of caution for you. Don't worry, I'm going to stop well short of don't, sticking instead to here's something you need to factor into your plans. Uh, on my own Allberg 30, which I sailed for 19 years, uh, and then it cuts off. <laughs> oh, go to the next one. It, it's, it's long. It continues on the next page. Oh my goodness. Yes, it's a long one. That's why Maddie's reading it for you guys. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, oh, I see. I was pretty much religious about rigging up a preventer whenever I was on a run. In spite of that, I still had an uncontrolled jibe that scared the bejesus out of me. And unfortunately, it didn't do much more than that. I was, and fortunately, I was running a split vang to the inner tracks on the deck. So the leeward vang was my preventer. And since it was slack, otherwise my jib, my jibe would have been prevented uh, or controlled by it. The boom was also free to pivot on the, the gooseneck. Now, the thing about a boom is that if you angle it up to be perpendicular to the backstay rather than parallel to the deck, it will extend past the backstay. So if the back winding force lifts the boom by buckling the sail before swinging the boom around, which it will if your vang is slack, the boom will crash into the backstay on its way around. When this happened to me, I was fortunate that the wind wasn't strong enough to break the backstay and cost me the rig. And with the haul, my gosh, it just keeps going. But it's, it's good. This, one, <laughs> this is a comment that really made me think. Oh, good. Yeah, or bad. <laughs> uh, trying to see where it... Uh, okay, and with the haul and rig being so originally designed, I'm fairly confident that the backstay, or likelier it's chain plate bolts, since those are what failed on Jean de Sud, yeah. uh, when she got rolled in a storm in the Southern Ocean, it is what would have broken first. So, just like it's imprudent to head out with an internal combustion engine and no fire extinguisher, even though an engine fire is unlikely, you still ought to be prepared for it, prudence demands that you Demands that you design your extension in such a way that if your boom were to try to swing through the backstay in an uncontrolled jibe with wind strong enough for this to break the boat in some way rather than having the backstay stop the boom, then the boat will break in one of the less catastrophic ways available. Oh my gosh, it's still going. But it's, this I think is this a really is the good last one. part. Yeah. Right. In per oh, sorry. In particular, this means that the portion of the hull aft of the mast needs to be stronger than the backstay. I mean, consider what happens if you have an event like my hypothetical uncontrolled jibe with a slack vang and stronger winds that loads the backstay enough to break the boat. If the backstay yields first, the mast comes down and you have to either cut it loose or bring it aboard before it slams into the hull too much and make, sure, and make your way to to a yard under motor or tow. Now with the VHF antenna being atop the mast for range, you're going to have a harder time calling for a tow if your motor isn't up to the trip home. Uh, but that call would be a pan pan. Okay, so this comment was instrumental. So originally, the reason that in that drawing, there's like a split in the backstay and the backstay runs down and then another one runs to the end was I was going to keep the backstay mounted to the original transom because strength wise like that transom can take the load everything is good but the the additional backstay was to support the strain that was put onto the boat from the stern anchor so when you're anchored and the boat's pitching and it's yanking on it that's going to lurch down on the extension, which then that load is going to be transmitted through the backstay, up through the rig, all the way to the headstay, and then down through the bobstay, and all that mess. So it spreads the load out through the rest of the boat. So that the goal was not so much that it would be for supporting the rigging, but that the rigging would be supporting the anchor. But then he said that part about how the boom can hit it. And, <laughs> and that got me. And that is where 
Originally, it was just like, this is just an extension to hold the stern anchor, nothing more. Strength isn't that big of a deal because the only time it's loaded is at anchor. To now we need to move the backstay. It's either move the backstay aft, so now this is gonna take the load of the backstay, or cut the boom, make it shorter. Now the boat has weather helm. If I cut the boom and make the main smaller, I lose the weather helm that I am counteracting by the bigger head sail area, which then messes up the whole idea of putting the bowsprit. So all this is really important. And his thing of as if you have a vang, you don't have to worry about it. I don't like vangs because vangs are a stress point in the boom. And they're, especially when you use a vang as a preventer, you risk if the sail, like if the boat jibes over and like rolls over and the, the end of the boom goes in the water and water's hitting it and the vang part way up on the boom is holding it back, it's gonna snap at the vang. So I, for that reason, I don't like vangs. Uh, when we rig a preventer, it's always from the end of the boom in and I also like sheeting to be from the end of the boom in. I, I, it's personal preference, but so I'm not gonna have a vang. So therefore I will have that problem every time we jibe uncontrollably, which happens occasionally because stuff happens. So now the whole issue is, okay, now what? So we move the backstays aft. Now this extension that was just ornamental and just supporting an anchor now needs to also sustain all the rig loads. I've been doing math today because I talked with a naval architect who suggested rather than building up the whole piece to be strong enough and then make the piece super heavy, build inside the piece a compression post and a horn timber with gussets that you know, transfer the load and then have the horn timber tie in. So we'll have the stringers up high and then the horn timber running down to the stern post uh, and glass the heck out of the sucker. So today I've been calculating what are the compressive loads at the new backstay angle, at the extended length, all, all that stuff. So yeah, there, there's a lot and then after all this, then I'm talking with a mechanical engineer, actually later today, to figure out how thick do we need the fiberglass or possibly carbon fiber, if we can get a hold of that stuff at a good price, uh, to be able to withstand those loads. Because my, my first run of calculations come in that the loads are around 8,000 pounds of compression per stay. And we're going to have two of them. So that's a lot of force on that. So uh, yeah, it's that comment was massive in redesigning the idea of this. So thank you very much because that story of the, oh, thank you very much for that comment. Okay. Uh, in response to what you said, so you assume the boom will lift up high and hit the backstay, not going to happen. Not going to happen? Oh, when you have a jibe, the, the sail twists as the, when the sail comes in, uh, when the boom starts coming in, the main sheet's no longer holding it and the boom lifts. It, it's how they do it. The sail twists and then it flops and the boom is up as it's going. And it, it goes pretty high up. So it, maybe it doesn't happen every time because I can say that when crash jibes occur, the last thing I'm doing is watching, what is that doing right now? It's more like, oh crap, let's avoid it. Let's avoid, ah, crap. <laughs> so uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so with so many head, this is Alan, yeah. with so many head sails, uh, head sail possibilities with multiple mounts, what sails are you planning on using and are you going to roller for reefing for staying Don't with, laugh. <laughs> are you going to roller reefing for staying with Hank or Hank? Okay. Yeah. Hank we're staying on. with Hank on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the, the sails that we're going to do. So on, on wisdom, we have the trisail, the jib, sorry. Well, yeah, we have the trisail, but head sails. We have the staysail, the jib, and then the drifter. The drifter is awesome. Uh, I, I love that sucker. Uh, now, that's our only overlapping head sail. So unless the winds are light, we cannot fly an overlapping head sail, and then we don't get the slot effect, so we really suffer in upwind performance. Plus, we're a cutter, and we're heavy, and we're full keel. So upwind kind of sucks for us. Uh, so I want to have a Genoa set up. So what we're going to be having is we'll have the staysail, we'll have a Genoa, and then we'll, ahead of the Genoa, we'll have the Yankee. And the Yankee will either be down at the bowsprit, like down low for high winds and downwind. It'll give us a ton of lee helm and just pull the boat downwind. 
or if the winds are lighter, we can raise it up above the Genoa and fly it in conjunction with the Genoa and the Yankee up high. And it'll fill in the triangle up high because the Yankee is the only one that'll go to the masthead. So that's the, that's the idea. So when we bring the Yankee up, it also moves the center of effort aft. We bring it down and moves the center of effort forward. The Genoa, since it overlaps and comes after the mast, its center of effort can actually be aft of the mast by accident, which is why a lot of people, they, they can't understand why they have so much weather helm, even though they have like a 150 Genoa flying and it's the full thing set, it should be pulling them downwind and giving them lee helm. And the reason is so much of like 50, it's a 150. If it were a hundred percent, it would then give you lee helm only. But uh, when it comes after the mast, the center of effort of that sail also comes aft. So that's, that's our plan there is to have a bunch of sails that we can move around and, and also have a drifter that can go onto the most forward head stay. So giant, giant sail, <laughs> tons of sail area. Oh, all right. With the drifter flying, some like rough calculations, our sail area to displacement would be about 24, which that puts us in the uh, racer category for sail area. <laughs> it's, it's a lot. I'm excited, <laughs> as you can see. Fast frames. Okay. Um, why is this doing this? I'll just use it sideways. Okay. Uh, Peter had something to say. Yes. I'm a bit concerned about the huge lifting moment that a wave from behind will cause. I'm glad you brought that up. Yes. How will you take up all that tension at the bottom of the extension, steel halters or something like that? Okay. So, yes, that is a huge thing. Uh, on Wisdom, it's got that 10 foot overhang. We'll have, like on average out in the ocean, it's like a 12 foot falling sea is like calm. Those are the, the nice days. They'll get up to 30 and 40 feet. We never had a wave crash in through the back because when the wave, Que paso? I know, it's okay, que paso? When the wave comes along, it, it hits under here and it lifts the whole boat up and we just rise up over it. We never get pushed. We've had breaking waves come along and break under the transom and we roll over them. It, it's very comfortable. Uh, to account for the whole lifting moment, we're gonna have those horn timbers. So I was gonna put stringers in, but like in the place of horn timbers, but after talking with the, uh, the naval architect, we're gonna make them actual horn timbers. Not out of wood, but tons of tons of fiberglass. <laughs> so that'll be the, the way that we'll be holding that down. Uh, no carbon fiber, can't inspect, failure is catastrophic. Well, okay, the, who said? Uh, sailing warm? Kaylin. Oh, okay. All right, if it was Warren that said that, I would say, okay, only <laughs> stick with the fiber. Class. Okay, so with carbon fiber, uh, my other joy in life, is Maddie and my my other joy in life is uh, cycling and uh, bikes are carbon fiber like and when they started people were really worried it was like you hit one rock it's like oh we don't know if the frame's gonna break and now they realized you know they're really strong so uh, carbon fibers come a long way and it's it works very similar to fiberglass it's just incredibly strong fibers it, it's nice so uh, I, I would fear carbon fiber the same way that I fear fiberglass, which I don't really fear. Just engineer it a lot. Over-engineer. And o then overbuild whatever you over-engineered. That's my motto. Yes. Yes. We're ready for the next Please YouTube read. comment. Yes. Um, extreme, oh, this is Jeff Maria Jensen. Extremes rarely look or perform well. The overhang is ridiculous. Okay. That's your opinion. <laughs> I love boats with massive overhangs. <laughs> like, I want to say yeah. that Herbie had this boat looking ridiculous with a very <laughs> massive overhang. And I told him, this is my, my contribution to this project. I looked at it and said, that looks stupid. And I she made did. him cut off like three feet. It was more. Four feet. Yeah, it was four I feet. I made him cut off four feet. I put a line where I wanted it to be, and I said, cut the rest of this off. So, and he did. So the funny part is when I started the whole design, 
And all right, so that's one of the beauties of YouTube is when you're editing videos, you then can see exactly what you said at this one point in time. So before Harry was born, I started working on all this. And uh, Maddie was very pregnant, and the last thing she wanted to do was go stand out in the cold and look at some foam in the air. So <laughs> the plan was, okay, I'll just build it as long as it could possibly be, and then at some point, we'll cut it off, and then we'll, we'll cut it off, and then it'll be smaller. I forgot that I said that. I forgot that Maddie and I agreed on that. And then... Like, it went so long that I was just, you know, unhinged and just <laughs> building this thing to its literal extreme. And then one day, Maddie came into the, the garage and said, that looks stupid. And then we figured out where we're going to cut it. And then I was quite annoyed at the time because <laughs> I'm like, you should have told me this so long ago. I was planning. And then when we were editing, I saw that I said specifically that we're going to be cutting it <laughs> and I'm building it to the longer than it needs to be. So yeah. Whoopsie. There's so, that. so the current size is only four feet. Like everyone's flipping out about this giant extension on the back. It's, it's four, four feet. feet. Like that's, the whole thing is four feet long. I made yeah. him cut it in half. <laughs> Pretty much. So, so the whole thing is that we want to be able to stand on the back of the thing and help another person in. So we need to fit two adults back there. That's it. So Manny and I just stood on the thing because it's, it was pretty strong. We stood on it and figured out, okay, this is how much space, drew a line, chopped it off. Uh, Andrew Thompson wrote 12 days ago, absolutely crazy idea in every sense. Best to concentrate on spending resources developing existing hall. Yes. Oh, so really, really quick about the super long overhangs, just Google Rita 4. <laughs> it's so pretty. Okay, moving on. So, yeah, developing the existing hall. Yeah, the existing, that's what I'm doing. I'm developing the existing hall. It doesn't have a good way to mount a stern anchor, and I am putting it there. While I read this one, can you write him? Write him? Yes, write him. Bring him up. Make him uncapsized? Uh... Bray Bay Outdoors says, I'm curious if you are planning to have a drogue or sea anchor with wind Ooh, pup. That one's a good one. Yeah. Sorry well, about the crying baby, guys. <laughs> Will there be chain plates attached to your extension or forward of the extension? For the sea anchor drogue, bro, I'll go. Yeah. For the, for the sea anchor, I'll, okay, I'll read here it. you go. Yeah. Let's leave your microphone so we don't listen to that. Just gonna let that Maddie fixes. Okay, so the question was, I'm curious if you're gonna have the sea anchor and the drogue, and are you gonna put the chain plates for the bridle onto the extension or onto the original transom, or are you gonna run it off of the bow? Uh, that is a very good question. So sea anchors are awesome. Uh, we, and I say this purely from YouTube videos and informational videos that came with the sea anchor that we purchased and have never used. We've done almost 20,000 miles, never once deployed it. I thought about it a few times, but then we figured some other way to fix the problem and then we did that instead. So, <laughs> that's the... <laughs> we will have a sea anchor. Actually, we already own, I already bought a sea anchor. I saw it for sale at a consignment shop and I'm like, that's the size I need for the Auberg and we bought it. So we have the uh, Paratech sea anchor because that's the one you want to get from a Florentino or Fiorentino or something. That's the brand you want. Just saying. Uh, okay, as for the drogue, I don't like drogues because they're easy to set, but then if you need to not have it set, they are such a pain to bring them back. So I kind of... All right, on Wisdom, we use the drogue. Oh. On Wisdom, we use the drogue uh, in the form of the electric prop, uh, the propeller from the electric motor. The, when we turn on regen, it acts like a drogue. I'm just gonna bring that microphone over here. It acts as, as a drogue and it's, it's really nice. I mean, we'll be surfing down waves going 14 knots, hit the bottom, go two, and then rise up going five and then do it again. And it's miserable. And then we turn on the regen and we do six knots the whole time, up and down through the whole thing. It's, it's glorious. So. I don't know if the electric motor on Windpuff is going to be enough regen dragness 
to act as a drogue. And if it isn't, then we'll need to set up a drogue. If we do set up a drogue, I will be connecting it to those stringers that we're gonna have running into the transom extension because they're gonna be really robust and tied into the original haul. If you go to the trans, like if you attach it to the original transom sides, like a normal chain plate for, the, for a drogue, and the line runs past the extension, that rope's gonna hit and chafe the paint away <laughs> and it's gonna look ugly. So I don't wanna do that. So it'll go mounted on the back if I have to do it. That was a very long-winded answer for yes. And if Apologies. you wanna if you wanna see more about drogues, check out our uh, video about storm tactics. Oh yes. <laughs> yes, I believe it was a live video. I just want to say um, real fast, I see that there's 75 people here, which is amazing. If you guys hit that like button, uh, it really helps us with the YouTube algorithm. So thanks. That's much appreciated, yes. Um, let's see, Lane Tatum says, I was wondering, not this project, but could a stainless steel framework alone Ooh. for an overhang? That is a very good question. And it was the original plan for all of this. It would be at the bumper, it could have a stern rail, it would be a platform to get on and off the boat, and uh, we could put the stern anchor in that thing. The reason it doesn't work for this boat is our transom is 18 inches high. <laughs> so. The, the forces that would be from that long lever arm over just an 18 inch rise, uh, it would punch a hole through the boat. So then, it, so then the problem became, okay, well, we'll just put more supports to spread the load out over more of the hull. And it, when I was doing the math, we pretty much had like a spider web of them. And at that point, it's like, why don't we just glass them together so we don't have this hideous monstrosity of a piping system hanging out the back of the boat. And then we're like, okay, let's fiberglass it. And literally, that's how the project evolved in our heads. Or in my head. In your head. My head, yeah. Not my head. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that, that is a very good question. And that was the original thought. Uh, when will you be doing sea trials with the sailboat? Five years. Yeah. So, we're, Maybe. Hopefully. this project is going to take a really long time, guys. A lot of it is because, I mean... The summer is a great time to work, but guess what we're doing this summer? Sailing to New York <laughs> um, in our other boat. So like this is, um, which we will be filming, but this is a, I don't want to say side project to our life, but it's, but there are other things happening and it's going to take, like, you know, we have a son <laughs> uh, and we're sailing. So it's going to take like, Five to ten years to do this. No, project. no, 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 no. Five, five years. Five, five years. years. Okay. I'm not working on this thing for ten years. We are going sailing again. <laughs> yeah, five years. Five years. So I have a lot I want to get done, and five years of work will get done. We'll see Hopefully, what it looks like in the end. <laughs> yeah, but we will be. Yeah, that's that's a huge thing because people will build a boat until it's done it's for never the rest done. of their life. Yeah, yeah. like I mean, I, we're still working on wisdom. Like this winter, I have projects of stuff I'm rebuilding on that, so that way we can go to New York next summer. So it's, it never ends. So <laughs> five years, guys, five years. <laughs> <laughs> um, Starting now, not this past year. Yeah, sure, <laughs> sure. okay. <laughs> we did have some major interruptions this yeah. past year. Like yep. giving birth. That happened. <laughs> okay, this one. Uh, could layer the foam board flush against the transom to keep layering and keep layering back, then shape. There's some fun grammar uh, in the world of YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I have two theories as to what he was trying to say. <laughs> One is, ho hold your hands up. Make make a cup shape. Okay. So one is that the foam boards go like this, like extra little fingers sticking out and then you shape it from there. If that's his idea, that is what they did on Duracell Project, and that is what most people do when they do this, because all they're doing is extend, like they're just carrying the lines that the boat already has for the raft. That works if you don't want to put a well for a wind vane, <laughs> and then not, yeah. So that's the general way of doing it, uh, but 
because of our situation. And, you know, as you can see, like the, the shape that it has, it, I could, I'd have to carve forever to get that out. So therefore we just made it separate. And then the second thing that I'm thinking he's trying to say is where the transoms like this, instead of putting the boards, you know, transverse to it and then coming out and then shaping the sides of it, he's saying stack them one onto another going out. Warren and I were originally going to do it that way. And then Warren, I was thinking, oh God, this is going to be a nightmare trying to carve each one to have the shape of the hall. And then Warren said, hey, let's just run them out, get the length, and then we can shape the size. I'm like, that's genius. Thank you, Warren. So uh, that's why we did it that way. You could have done it the other way. It would have just been a lot more work. Somebody, 1869, says... Definitely not how I would have done gone about it. One, hire a pro to li LIDAR, LIDAR scan, oh, LIDAR scan the boat uh, and produce an accurate 3D model of the hull. Weirdly, a lot of people have been suggesting that as if it's like affordable. Or easy to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, to use 3D modeling software to project the hull to where you want it and build the transom station, a mid station, and the new transom station. Then set it all up on a strong back and build it like any small sheathed strip sailboat build. Modern tools have their place in the DIY shop. The scanning is not as expensive as you might think. Neither is the clean, cleaned up 3D model bit. You could even go so far as to have the station CNC cut and sent to you. There are many local mecha mechanist, mechan me machinist, machinist. I'm, I'm doing great. <laughs> Shops that are more than willing uh, to help with such unique and interesting projects. Thank you for calling it unique and interesting. So, <laughs> if you guys notice on Wisdom, the like abundant lack of electronics and computer stuff. Everyone's been telling me I need to get Raspberry Pi and open VPN or CP. Oh, it takes oh. the fun out of it, guys. Well, we like to do things the hard way. Oh well, that's that's your view on it. <laughs> I don't get computers. Like I'm just. <laughs> I check my email. It's amazing that we're on YouTube. Yeah, like honestly, <laughs> YouTube is the most techy thing that we do. Uh, like, yeah, we don't have chart plotters on the boat or anything. It's yeah. <laughs> so, so when when I was reading the comments, like scan it, three D model it. Another person had along the same vein. They said a day at a computer is better than a day out in the cold. <clears throat> Good for you. <laughs> I hate working on a computer. <laughs> so, so that, yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I see it, but I don't want to do it. I, I would rather shape it with my hands. So, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay, so this is a bit of a long one. Um, it's also a bit mean. <laughs> It's almost like this is a really, really bad idea that offers almost nothing. You really need to zoom out on the whole project of the stern extension. It simply does not offer enough pros versus cons. The longitudinal stability of your boat will be hugely affected. Your ability to run with waves will be zero. No. Any rising wave from the stern is going to change your longitudinal center of buoyancy. Uh, because your rudder position isn't changing, you're going to have a hard time controlling the boat due to the rudder movement uh, arm being unchanged. Rudder moment arm being unchanged. Maybe you had a naval architect actually do some math. Maybe you didn't. But it is not going to be an ocean-going boat anymore. So, that... Uh, one big thing. So yes, this would be a true statement if we had a sugar scoop extension we were doing and if we had a fin keel. Neither of which is true. Yeah, so full keel boats do not turn. If you want them to turn, it's not going to happen. And if you don't want them to turn, they will do what you want them to do as long as it's go straight. <laughs> so like you'll have waves pick you up, toss you around, and you just go straight. And so... 
yeah, not so much. And then the second part about the buoyancy in the back, there's a huge hole in this thing. Like it's not a big buoyant object. There's two small pontoons to a very small platform. So if anything, it's more gonna be a slapping effect as it then hits the transom, which then rises up and carries over and all that business. Uh, but just looking at how far the waves actually ever came from the edge of the extension on Wisdom, I, I'm not really concerned at all about this. I wish we could just yeah. draw what people think we're doing versus yeah. what we're actually doing. I think it would look like those drawings <laughs> of like if you like took a photo of a dog that a kid drew or a right. horse. And you're just like, mm. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Sailing Segundo says, uh, when will you be in New York? We're going to be in New York in the summer. We haven't decided exactly. I mean, you know us and weather windows. So yeah. we, we can plan where uh, and generally what season, <laughs> but we can't exactly plan when. So, so Yeah, the, the when depends on the weather. We'll leave when it's right to go. And then... Depending how much I get done on my projects, we're either doing the C&D canal, if we have a big enough battery bank for it. If we don't, we'll be going out the Chesapeake Bay, shooting offshore, and then coming up the Hudson, I believe? The, I think. Into New York. Yeah. The big entrance. But like before we do that, we have to move our chain plates to external. And yeah. Like there's a lot, we actually have a lot of work we're doing on Wisdom that's yeah. gonna be coming to the videos as well. Which hasn't started yet, though. But <laughs> but the work on wisdom is we're putting we're moving the chain plates to make them external. I need to check our stem because we have a weird crack in there. I don't like that. I haven't looked at it yet, so I can't really say why. Uh, and then uh, yeah, chain plates move them to external, and then add another battery, and because <laughs> that's minor. And then uh, I, I I'm tired of the generator sitting on the back and being really loud. So I'm going to build a place to mount it and a water lift muffler for it and engineer all of that. Yes. This winter. Uh-huh. Which is we go. not much longer. Which is why we might be doing down the bay um, and out the ocean. <laughs> Dave, the MMP, says a really sweet comment. Some people will do anything to create a video for YouTube. Buy a bigger boat. Can't wait until your insurance company gets wind of this. So, all right. The part of this that bothers me is the insurance company part. The amount of people that say, oh, you can't do this because your insurance this, or you know, don't do that way because your insurance. Who cares about your insurance company? <laughs> if your boat wrecks, the insurance company is going to find a way to not pay you. They do not care about you. <laughs> do what is best for your boat not what your insurance company says you need to do. Like, ah. <laughs> we hear that so much. And we've heard yeah. it ever because we have an electric motor and yeah. synthetic rigging. So we hear it constantly. Yeah, honestly, your, your best insurance is a really good anchor. Get a Mantis and a ton of chain. There is your insurance. And then also, like, don't be an idiot and, like, don't stay in Hurricane Alley during hurricane season like we did. This will, <laughs> this will add approximately 50 kilograms to the stern where it's not wanted. I'm afraid you're going to upset the balance of this boat with this project. Okay, so 50 kilograms is roughly 110 pounds, roughly. Which, yes, except they were wrong because we're going to be adding roughly 200 pounds based on some calculations that I've done roughly. Uh, so 200 pounds back there, sounds like a lot. I weigh almost 200 pounds, thankfully. <laughs> After Christmas, I'm still shy of 200. So it's literally, if I'm standing on the back of the boat, hanging out back there. That's it. That's it, that is it. It's one human hanging off the back of your boat. That's, that's not gonna upset the balance, people. Lincoln like, Lincoln yeah. says, like the concept, but in following C, you need something providing strength to the counter, to the counter, which has buoyancy forces. What's your plan? The plan is to reinforce it properly. So stringers, timbers, all, all that stuff. We're gonna tie it in. Uh, you pay dockage. This is another person. Oh, this is a collar and Hames. Uh, you pay dockage by the foot, right? 
How many feet are you adding to the arse of your Alberg and why? Love your channel and curious how this is going to end up. Happy holidays, you crazy two. <laughs> so we're adding four feet. Average docking is, average docking Depends is. Depends on where you are. Average docking is $2 a foot. Yeah. Now there's some place, we like the ones that are a dollar a foot. If they're more than $2 a foot, we don't go there because it's expensive and then we anchor for free. So adding four feet to the back, we're adding $8 per night if we tie up. But if we anchor, like we do most of the time, it's free. So, so yeah. And we're going to add the length anyway with a stern anchor. And if the, you go to a place where they actually measure you and you have your dinghy hanging on davits, they're charging you that distance anyway. So it's like, mm, same thing. Um, Michael Russell, quick question. How do you plan to remove water from the aft anchor locker? Oh, very good one. Uh, I've been thinking on this one a lot. So the one that I'm st like kind of leaning towards is the dumbest, like, like dumb as in not complicated solution. Simplest. Simplest solution. Thank you. A limber hole. Just have a hole in the bottom of it that just drains out and have a little pipe that way it doesn't dribble down the rest of the boat. That is what I'm leaning towards. My issue with doing it is if we're on a long tack, you run the risk that water come in and then it become heavier and, and all that. So I, I'm hoping my ideal is that we have a float switch and a little bilge pump and it dump it out. That's my, that's my like gold standard goal, but we might just do a limber hole. <laughs> um, Jim Duke says, add another battery, more 18,650s. No, uh, or going prismatic. 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 Prismatic, prismatic. Well, yes, very much. <laughs> <laughs> so prismatic cells, when we did ours, uh, prismatic cells were a lot more expensive than the cylindrical cells. So for cost reasons, we did the cylindrical. It was so much work. <laughs> so uh, the prismatics are now about the same price. So there is literally no reason to buy cylindrical cells and do it the way we did it. Do prismatics, they're so much easier now. Or they're, they've always been easier. They're so much cheaper now. Yes. We're going to do a couple more. I realize we've been an hour. Oh, yeah, um, sorry. So uh, we're just going to do a couple more questions. If you have any last questions about the transom, uh, do leave them in the, uh, in the live chat, and we'll try to get to them real fast. If we don't get to your questions, leave them as a comment, and we will get to them afterwards, okay? But thanks, guys. Thanks for being here. Um, Len, Len, Leonard. Well, this is the oh, okay. CAD CAM make it. Yeah, we already yeah. did that. Yep. Uh, this guy just says, please stop. Um, yeah. Adding a longer transom will give more windage in bad Ooh. weather and will affect steering. Plus, any big wave that hits you, I wouldn't like to know the outcome. Fair winds to you. Yes, for sugar scoops. Sugar scoops and big, broad, flat transoms. Uh, windage also is. Like in a bad storm, it's more from freeboard that's going to do it. And this boat has no freeboard at all. It's, it's very low to the water. So freeboard's not there. Uh, the part that I'm making is very small in actuality. Uh, so there's not much buoyancy from it. it yeah, not really a huge issue. <laughs> um, oh, and then if a wave does hit back there, as we've mentioned before with the whole long overhang, it just rides over them. They don't like hit and push. They like hit and blow over you. Thanks, Trev. Yep. Uh, okay, um, MR, will the transom extension improve the efficiency while motoring electrically? Yes, in the fact that it will give us more solar panels to power said motor. It will, when we're motoring, it'll be out of the water, so it won't do anything at all, except give more solar panels. <laughs> solar. <laughs> so, I mean, in conclusion, um, this project, what? There's a comment that we didn't get to, oh, which I find okay. is really important. But there's a bunch of these. Okay, so the main thing is I'm not using marine grade products for all the work that I've done. And it's gonna just pop off. And it, when you glue it on there, it's just gonna fall off in a storm. Okay, what we made was the pattern. The pattern then is used to make the mold. The pattern comes out of the mold and is now just sitting in a trash pile. Uh, then the mold is there, and in the mold, I'm building everything out of marine grade products. The reason I built non marine grade products is they are cheaper. And <laughs> like they're a not lot cheaper. going on the boat. Yeah, they're not going on the boat. And then the whole 
like glue onto the transom and it'll pop off. If you glue it on, it's gonna pop off, but I'm not gluing it on. I'm like attaching it, like really well attaching it. So that's a, a huge thing I wanted to, to make sure to get it. How much danger is there of US Customs destroying custom work and inspections? No. None. Yeah. No. Oh, well, all right, so if you're inspecting this boat for like commercial, uh, there it's, no, it's still not rigorous. The amount of boats with like major like structural, like they are broken and still pass inspection. I, yeah. Are but. you putting an electric motor in Windpuff? Yes. yes. <laughs> uh, if so, what size? Same as Wisdom? No. Um, no, we're doing 10. Yeah, 10 kilowatts. Yeah. So literally our, the motor that's in Wisdom is two of these and we're putting one of these in Windpuff. But a ton of batteries. <laughs> so many batteries. Um, oh. Cache says, why? And I'm assuming maybe you just joined us. You should just watch the video that yeah. we just... <laughs> but, 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 some more things. So, uh, if you guys haven't seen James the Sailor Man, he's been going all over the world. He's currently in the South Pacific on an Auburg 30. I found him because he has a hard Dodger, and I... We're that's gonna do another that. thing we're doing, <laughs> but later. I'm sure we'll get tons of comments about how we're destroying the boat with that one, too. But, uh... In one of his videos, he was having an issue where waves were boarding over the stern and his cockpit was full of water and not draining faster than the waves were coming in. Uh, because of that, like, yes, we're doing this. It's gonna be added buoyancy. The thing's gonna be, hopefully, <laughs> airtight. And then a pump in there to pump out anything that leaks in anyway. And then I'm also making the cockpit smaller. We're re greatly reducing the volume in the cockpit and then greatly increasing the amount of scuppers and the volume that they can flow. So the idea is, Wave, if waves do come over the transom and over the stern and come on in, they then go out quickly and don't have anywhere to really sit while they're in there. So, yes, we, we have thought these things through <laughs> a lot. Hervey <laughs> bounces so many things off of me every single day, and I am his sounding board. <laughs> Uh, but I do have opinions and... Uh, like make that smaller, it looks like stupid. Like make that smaller, it looks stupid. Um, and, you know, this is a small... This is the beginning of our wind puff transformation. This is, this is a small part of it. Um, so I'm really excited once we get past this part to, to do all the rest um, yeah. and to be personally a little more involved in some of it. Is some more than others. <laughs> uh, the itchy parts she'll let me do. <laughs> yeah. Um, but guys, thank you so much for joining us. Again, if you have further questions, please leave them in the comment section of the video and we'll answer them as best we can. I hope that this shed some light and maybe gave you a little more confidence in Herbie for this project. Uh, we It's been heavily, heavily researched. Um, very, very intensely thought through and i have i have all the faith that it's going to be amazing so hopefully you guys do too at this point and we're just we're really excited to bring you along for the ride uh to watch this take shape literally and, and if you're a naval architect i'd love some input and thoughts and to look over calculations to make sure i'm not you know missing something gross and massive uh i've had Three naval architects contact me. Uh, one never got back to me. <laughs> the other two, ones I've talked to a lot, and the other one I'm talking to uh, next week. So, so yes, there are yeah. people. Good things but, yeah. to come. Lots of people involved in this project. Yes. And uh, guys, most of all, happy, happy 2024. Have an amazing New Year's Eve. And we will see you next year. <laughs> Bye. I'm getting it. Got it.